Welcome back everyone. Today we're going to be talking about neonatal critical care or NPS review. We're going to start this series with a lecture about some cardiology topics and we're going to open with anatomy and physiology. So the development of the cardiovascular system begins toward the end of the third week and by about the beginning of the fourth week there's going to be a heartbeat. Uh, it's a critical period of heart development around 20 to 50 days after fertilization. Many critical events occur during cardiac development, any deviation from the normal pattern may cause a congenital heart defect and causing the heart not to develop properly. All right, well, diving right in, we're going to talk about normal heart and normal circulation that goes around. So we're going to start down here with the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava. We know that those are going to dump into the right atrium. It's going to pass through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. From there, it's going to go up through the pulmonary valve to the pulmonary artery where it's going to go to the lungs. That's where it's going to pick up oxygen, remove some carbon dioxide, and it's going to come back into the left atrium. From the left atrium, it's going to travel through the mitral valve into the aortic, the left ventricle, where then it passes through the aortic valve, out the aorta, and up to the coronary arteries, through the transverse aorta, and then down the ascending or the descending aorta. All right, so fetal hemoglobin, we know that the fetus is going to be a little hypoxic and they're going to have a PAU2 of about 40. But because it's fetal hemoglobin, it's going to cause a left shift where it's going to have a high affinity for oxygen. So unlike the picture here, the red blood cells are going to be more likely to pick up oxygen instead of picking up the carbon dioxide. Um, and some other anatomy things is we have our placenta, which has going to be connected to the baby via the umbilical cord, which has one vein and two arteries. Um, that one vein is going to go in to the baby's stomach, and we're going to get into what it does after that. The two arteries are going to be responsible for returning the used blood from the baby back into the placenta, where it's going to do its oxygen exchange and then be returned. Okay, so there are three fetal shunts that are unique to the fetus. First up, we have our ductus arteriosus, and this protects against circulatory overload. It allows the right ventricle to gain some strength. It has high pulmonary vascular resistance and low pulmonary blood flow. It carries mostly oxygen-saturated blood. Next up, we have the ductus venosus. It's a fetal vessel containing the umbilical vein into the inferior vena cava. Blood flow is regulated via a sphincter. It carries mostly high oxygenated blood. And finally, we have the foramen ovale, and it shunts highly oxygenated blood from the right atrium into the left atrium. And these uh, structures, after the baby's born, they end up closing. They don't go away forever. So you hear, see here are, on the left are fetal structures. They end up turning into some adult structures. The foramen ovale turns to the fossa ovalis. We have the umbilical vein turns into a ligament. The ductus venosus turns into a ligament. Um, the umbilical arteries and abdominal ligaments turn into some other ligaments and some vascular arteries. And the ductus arteriosus turns into the ligamentum arteriosum. Kind of sounds like we're in Harry Potter world now. As soon as the baby's born, the foramen ovale, the ductus arteriosus, the ductus venosus, and the umbilical vessels are no longer needed. Upon first breath, the pulmonary alveoli open up, pressure in the pulmonary tissues decrease. Blood from the right heart rushes and fills the alveolar capillaries. Pressure in the right side of the heart decreases. Pressure in the left side of the heart increases as more blood flow. More blood is returned from a well-vascularized vascularized pulmonary tissue via the pulmonary veins to the left atrium. This results in some circular changes, such as blood pressure is now high in the aorta and the systemic circulation is now established. Control of the circulation is a reflux that's regulated peripherally by baroreceptors in the aortic arch and in the carotid sinuses. Centrally, it is regulated by baroreceptors in the cardiovascular center of the medulla, and respiratory and circulatory reflexes are usually strong in the healthy full tomb new newborn, but their efficiency in controlling their cardiovascular function is susceptible to environmental factors. The ductus arteriosus constructs, constricts at birth, but there's often a small shunt of blood from the aorta to the left pulmonary artery for a few days, even in a healthy full term infant. In premature infants and those with persistent hypoxia, the ductus may remain open for much longer. Oxygen is the most important factor in controlling the closure of the ductus in full-term infants. Closure of the ductus appears to be mediated by bradykinin, 
a substance that is released from the lungs upon initial inflation. Bradykinin has a potential has a potent contractile effect on smooth muscle. Action depends on the high oxygen content of the aortic blood resulting from aeration of the lungs of bird. When the PAO, PaO2 of blood passing through the ductus reaches about 50 millimeters of mercury, the wall of the ductus constricts. As a result, the reduced as a result of the reduced pulmonary vascular resistance, the pulmonary artery, artery pressure falls below the systemic level and blood flow through the ductus is diminished. So now if you look at our picture here, we have the fetal heart and the newborn heart. As you can see, on the right, the ductus arteriosus is now closed. The foramen ovale is now closed, and we have a normal newborn heart. All right, well, moving right along, we're going to get into some dysrhythmias that you may see in neonatal patients. First off from the dysrhythmias is sinus tachycardia. This is characterized by a heart rate of 180 to 220. This may be episodic. Um, it's also, it can be due to hypovolemia, where you have low blood volume, or hyperthermia, where a patient is hot. Um, some other things that can cause it are pain, agitation, shock, a condition called hydrops, or if a patient has an infection. Uh, usually there isn't a direct treatment. You'll just um, treat the underlying cause. So if a patient's in pain, you try to manage their pain. If they're agitated, try to make them more comfortable. If they have some low blood volume, you try to you know, give them some more fluids. If they have an infection, you treat the infection. And if they're hot, you try to cool them down a little bit. Next, we have sinus bradycardia. This is a heart rate of less than 90 beats a minute. It's very common in premature infants, usually due because of their immature central nervous system. It also may be caused by vagal stimulation, hitting the vagus nerve and suctioning or pressing anything down the infant's throat, placing an esophageal um, probe or a tube, maybe. It can also be caused by apneas. Treatment for bradycardia is usually to check the respiratory situation. Brady's are most common, most often caused by hypoxia, causing depression of the myocardium or slowing of the heart rate. If the infant is not responding to oxygen, usually you may have to result to providing a little stimulation to hit them in the feet or pat gently on their feet, do a sternal rub. Uh, if they don't respond to that, you may have to resort to advanced resuscitation where you have to follow your NRP guidelines. Finally, you are going to correct any hypoxia that may be present. So if they're hypoxic, you're going to provide oxygen or increase their support. Next up is supraventricular tachycardia. This is a heart rate of greater than 220 beats a minute. It can be common among newborns. It's usually classified as being stable or unstable. So if there's uh, symptoms or they're not symptomatic. It can be caused by cardiac defects, uh, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, myocarditis, and repeat episodes may lead to uh, congestive heart failure. Now, treatment for SVT is usually based on if it's stable or unstable. So stable is you may provide some vagal stimulation, you may suction them or place an esophageal probe. They may ask you to provide pressure to the eyeball or perform a carotid sinus massage, and this is contraindicated in infants because placing pressure on their eyeballs can cause some retinal detachment. So that's not something you want to be responsible for doing. Another treatment you may see is denison at 0 0.05 milligrams per kilo. Unstable SVT is usually treated more aggressively. So we'll get our drugs out. We'll do a denison for parenolol, procaridamine, amiodarone. And if you're going to have to convert, if you reach the point where you need to provide synchronized cardioversion, you're going to need to be intubated. And the dose for the cardioversion is going to be a half to one joule per kilo. Complete heart block. This is common in infants that are born to mothers that have lupus. It also can be common after cardiac surgery. It also could be due to an infection, congenital heart defect, myocarditis, and lupus. So just remember that. Think if uh, you ever have a question presented to you about a mother with lupus and a baby having arrhythmias, think complete heart block. Treatment for complete heart block usually involves pacing, so you're going to have to insert them uh, either an external pacer, usually with pacing wires, or you might resort to some isoproteranol to try to convert that. Atrial flutter 
is characterized by sawtooth appearance on the EKG. This is usually caused by damage to the sinus node, congenital heart disease, or maybe a cardiac catheterization. Treatment for this includes digoxin or pranolol. You might have to resort to cardioversion if the patient's unstable. Next up, we have hyperkalemia. This isn't a dysrhythmia per se, but it is a condition that may cause some dysrhythmias. So this is characterized by potassium of greater than 6.5 milliequivalents a liter. It can be caused by hemorrhage, bruising, prematurity, acidosis, or renal failure. And what you're going to see on your EKG with this one is some tenting T waves or wide QRS. Treatment for this is diuretics that don't spare potassium, so the ones that are going to diurese the patient and make them pee out a bunch of potassium. You also may resort to glucose or in, and insulin infusion because that can also draw down your potassium levels. Now that is the end of the first lecture in this series, so here's some references and further reading if you want to dive into this topic a little bit further.